I am going to get started for us here um, with what we have. So hello and welcome everybody tuning in. I'm Rebecca Bry. I'll be your host for this panel, Discovering Opportunities for Local Action and Advocacy. So if that's what you're looking for, you have found the right place. I encourage you to use the chat located on your right hand side of the video. Most of you have found it by now, but maybe you're new. So make sure that you've highlighted session versus event or direct messages. Session is where you want to be for this particular one to be able to ask our panelists questions. And please do. We would also love for you to introduce yourself, say hello. We can't see any of your names terribly easily. So please say hello and let us know where you're listening from. Um, and without further ado, let's hear from our panelists. We have an incredible group here today, all different ways you can get more involved to transform our community to a new way forward. First up, let's hear from Mason Jordan. Mason is joining us from Florida Kids for Clean Water. Mason, will you tell us about yourself and the organization? Um, so I'm Mason Jordan. Um, I'm 13 and I'm a founding member of Suncoast Waterkeepers um, Youth Oriented uh, Program. Um, and we educate, advocate, and work for Sarasota's local environment. Um, and some of the things we've recently done is we've created videos for educating voters on local referendums. And uh, we've written letters to newspapers, politicians, um, and we've created um, and signed um, ask for signatures on pledges and have plans to continue working to on on upcoming issues. Um, me personally, I am currently in the early stages of researching um, the topic of sewage leaks into our local waters. Um, and I've also participated in the year-long advanced homeschool science program at Marine Aquarium. And this gave me the unique opportunity to attend the Youth Con Conservation Summit um, held at Moat last year. Uh, but I initially got involved in Kids for Clean Water after completing the Bishop Planetarium um, homeschool science class two years ago, where I met Bryce and Coco, um, two of the other founding members of Kids for Clean Water. Um, and Bryce really loves nature and he cares for the environment deeply. Um, and he was given the opportunity to start a club and I'm really honored to represent him and all his efforts today. Um, but I too care for the environment and I really love having a club um, where I can voice my opinion and, ha and advocate in a way that's effective. Um, and then also just uh, one last thing is in the next month we have scheduled Zoom meetings with Dick Eckenrod, president of the Manatee Fish and Game Association. Um, to talk about the land referendum, cabinets for clean water, and county commissioner Misty Servia to learn about local issues, including fish farms, plastic bag usage, sewage, and more. Uh, if you want to um, check out our social media page to find out details about dates and times for meetings that are open to public, um, check out us um, at Florida Kids for Clean Water on Facebook. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that I'm really honored to be a panelist in this year's Sustainable Communities Workshop. That is so amazing, Mason. I don't think I was nearly as connected um, as you were when I was your age, but I can't wait to hear more in a little bit. I love that you said that um, you're working to educate and advocate um, very much. And I see Bryce and Coco over in the um, session chat too. So everybody should say hello to them over there. Next up, let's hear from Laura Aguirre from Audub Audubon, Florida. Laura, what are you working on with Audubon, Florida? Thanks so much, and thanks so much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, my name is Laura Aguirre, I'm with Audubon, Florida, and I'm our state field coordinator for our climate program. So a lot of folks know Audubon as a bird organization, and that is rightly so, um, and we're proud of it, but we're also the state's foremost conservation organization. So we work on everything from coast to working lands to climate, um, and that's where my work comes in. So. We focus on advocating for renewable energy, energy efficiency, and importantly, natural solutions, things like ecosystem restoration and living shorelines. And I work all over the state um, with our members, our advocates, and our chapters. So we have 45 chapters across the state. You all might be familiar with Sarasota Audubon or Audubon of Manatee County. Um, and so in the work that I do, what we're, what we're really aiming for is helping to educate and give people the tools that they need to talk to their elected officials at the local, the regional, and the state and federal level about why climate solutions are important to them, and also to highlight the really good work that's happening. 
in Florida, so much of the climate work has been from the ground up. It's cities and counties, as we've heard today in this workshop, that are really taking the lead. Um, and so we want to make sure that people have the opportunity and the tools that they need to talk to their elected officials, to share the good work that's happening at the local and regional level, and also to share that that's the kind of leadership that we're looking for at the state and federal level as well. Um, and so I also saw, and I just wanted to say hello to one of our folks from Sarasota Audubon who I saw entering, her name is Karen Willie, and she does some awesome work uh, that I would love to talk about later, but if she could drop her info in the chat, um, it would be great to connect her with folks as well. Thank you, Laura. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to hear too what some of your favorite, um, the work that you've been able to highlight, like what some of your favorites are. Um, so our final panelist who has assured me he has jokes for days, John Patton sharing about the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project. And he has some slides here that I'm gonna pull up. Thank you, Rebecca. John, what is the story with the Ecoflora Project? Thank you, Rebecca. So I'm actually one of two co-coordinators working with Selby Marie Botanical Gardens to help run this. The other one is Lisa Daly. She's also in the chat. Hi, Lisa. And we are running the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project. So what happened was New York Botanical Garden wanted to, one, help conserve and improve the scientific data for a lot of the plants that we have in North America and actually throughout the world. This is a worldwide program, but this is our local focus. And you use the iNaturalist app, which you can see on your on the screen in front of you, to take observations using a phone or camera. And not only does this give you a physical picture of the plant so that you can kind of see the 3D structure, you can see the color of flowers, which you don't get in pressed or spirit specimens, which is when you uh, put plant parts into an alcohol jar, you don't get a lot of the same detail. And so by using this, we can track the location, the look, the flowering times, and so much more information about plants and animals, the app covers everything, than just um, doing traditional methods of science. And so the nice thing is anyone with a phone can use this app. Anyone with a camera can use this app. As long as you can upload the photos, it's extremely user-friendly. It's very, very easy to use. And not only have we found several new species to manatee in Sarasota, I personally got to go out and do my first botanical specimen, which was very fun, and fi we found a new invasive species. So not only does this help us conserve our native plants and animals, because you can focus on birds, you can help monitor water quality by just looking at the plants and animals that are there, so it really interacts with everyone else in this call, but you can also use it to help prevent new invasive species, like two out of every three invasive plants in Florida actually are accidental releases by homeowners, whether they're in yards, gardens, or landscapes. And so being able to prevent these from getting into the wild, like we found Bacopo repens, which is a plant from the fish trade, growing in retention ponds, and it's not normally native here. So the app has just endless uses. And now to bring you into the puns, each month we have a different eco quest. So like this month for the month of October, we have the Okie Pokey, where we're asking people to go out and find oak trees in their neighborhoods. And while we always prefer to find the wild species, because that gives us, you know, more of the knowledge, you can also check mark for cultivated species. So if you're growing something in your yard or you're um, having something in your yard and you just want to catalog it, um, you can do that as well. And that actually helps the app learn. So all pictures of plants and animals really helps. We just ask not too many selfies and pictures of your dogs. That doesn't help the app as much. But there's endless utility to it. We also do bio blitzes. Just last week, we did a social distance group out to Circus Hammock, and we were able to help them do their land surveys where they go out and they catalog the plant species out there. And it was amazing to see that we actually were able to help the county staff find new plants and further identify species that they hadn't been able to identify before. So anyone and everyone, people of all ages can really help and get involved with citizen science with this app. You can really learn more about the world around you. And of course, see great plant puns. Sean, that sounds unbelievable. Could you tell us 
Sorry, I had to. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about why you feel it's so important to connect people to, to their surroundings? Well, honestly, one, this entire sustainability conference, we've been talking about the massive issues, climate change, red tide, you know, waste, habitat loss. And so much of this stuff starts at home. In fact, just through my yard, which was initially empty, and planting plants and using iNaturalist, I'm able to find that I was getting butterflies that were on the endangered species list. I found a mallow scrub hair streak eating the native plants that I put in my yard. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't have used the app. Or like you could find out that maybe you're putting invasive species in your yard, which take up valuable habitat for native plants. Or maybe you can help find new species that need conservation when you're out on a trip in Mayaka. And again, Laura works with the Audubon Society. What do all birds need? Plants, whether you're seabirds, shorebirds, whether you're birds in forests or pinelands or terrestrial birds, all birds and all life really depends on plant in some ways. And this app is just so useful for helping us document our plants locally. And so I really encourage people to go online and join the project. We have botanists helping you identify the plants. I'm an aquatics person. I specialize in fish and aquatic plants. So when we were doing a cactus uh, bio blitz, I was like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. But we had this specialty. We had the people with the specialties and the knowledge to help us through it. And it's all about learning and getting more in touch with the community and learning more about the plants around you. A lot of people have plant blindness where they're like, oh, that looks pretty. It's green. It's helpful. But you can't have clean water. You can't have healthy fat baby birds without the right diversity of plants in your community. And so we're here yeah, to help you I wanna... figure it out. Like next month's EcoQuest, <laughs> go fig or go home. I want to open it up to uh, Mason and Laura. What have you found um, when you're connecting people to their surroundings and helping them educate and advocate like you both kind of shared? Um, would you like to go first or shall I? Go ahead, Mason. Um, so I think it's really simple, actually. Um, I think that people really enjoy being in nature. It, it makes them feel good and it's scientifically proven. It reduces anger, anxiety, stress. And really just being in nature, it's it's fun, it's it's interesting, it really feels like an adventure. Um, and like, um, you can go into nature now and with technology, you can, if you, well, what is this plant? Well, you can use iNaturalist and you can figure it out and you can feel like you're making a difference in the world. Laura? So this is a great opportunity for me to talk about <laughs> Sarasota Audubon's work. And I see that um, Karen Willie, who I spoke about earlier, um, has entered the session and so I will be dropping her information in there but she came up with this really beautiful way of connecting people to nature and climate solutions at the same time and she started hosting climate walks in the last years so in different natural areas she'd go out people would walk she would talk about uh, different climate impacts like sea level rise or um, mangrove retreat and then at the end of the walk everybody sits down and they talk about solutions and 2021 is still tentative, but there's a series of those walks planned as well. And as Mason pointed out, right, just being in nature is very grounding for people. But also what we know about climate communications and climate psychology is that when people are able to see the impacts of climate change, it's easier for them to keep climate change at the forefront of their mind. So when we have that connection to our natural world and I mean, Sean, you, you brought up being able to know the plants that are there, right? To know that the birds that are there. When you, when you start noticing those changes in biodiversity, when you start noticing those changes in migration patterns, the, the fact of climate change and the impetus to get involved and use that experience and that knowledge to advocate for solutions is even greater. Leads me to my next question. So Laura, you talked about the walks that you're doing. Mason, how can people get more involved with Florida Kids for Clean Water and support you? Um, so Both online now and um, if the world allows it in person in the future. Right, so currently um, with COVID-19, um, we are just encouraging people to get involved by um, going to our Facebook page, um, posting information, asking questions, bringing local environmental issues to our attention. Um, and then also we are creating um, 
activities for younger kids to participate in. Um, uh, just Kids Within Water is a place where kids um, can advocate their opinion. And um, we, we just really um, want uh, kids to be able to feel like they have a voice because often adults are the ones in positions of power in discussing these topics. Um, and so uh, we also highly encourage kids to write letters um, because we feel that's really powerful. Um, and so that's some of the ways that we're getting uh, kids and adults to get involved. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna broaden it up a little bit more. So when you, and this one's kind of going to Laura first, when you first started doing this work, working on climate advocacy and understanding about the walks, um, what surprised you most when you started learning about it? Was there anything that um, you connected with that surprised you? I don't know. If su so I would say what surprised me, but maybe heartened or gladdened me is that when I started, um, I was a full-time high school teacher. So I came at this from a very different angle. And when I was seeing people who were speaking in commission meetings and writing to their elected officials and doing the kind of work that Mason's talking about but, and that I now engage in now, I was very intimidated. <laughs> uh, and I guess what surprised me the most was just how welcoming the community of advocates is. There are so many people who are willing to lend a hand and teach you how to get involved. Um, and that's the work that I do now. So at Audubon Florida, we offer trainings on effective climate communications, on Advocacy 101, on how to communicate with elected officials. And all folks need to do is send us an email and we can set up a training for them. And I think what surprised me really, really the most was how, how much people want to help you get involved. Um, and now that I'm on the other side, uh, I am constantly, constantly gladdened and heartened that I continue to see that energy in the advocacy community. That's one of the things that I think that I say that part of the environmental work for me too has been that I meet the best people. And so um, this is a prime example, having all of you here on this panel today and getting to hear about the incredible work that you're doing and how it's all interconnected. Um, Sean, what about you? What surprised you when you really dug in and started doing this work or where do you find the most joy in doing it? So. That's such a hard question because there's so many different great opportunities I've had. And as someone who has multiple environmental based jobs, I get to see a lot of different sides. And so again, meeting all the passionate people, there are so many people who do so much manpower and a lot of it's even unpaid just to help the environment. The passionate botanists at Selby who you know, come out and like really put in the effort on these projects, the volunteers who came out and took pictures, and the county staff were like, yeah, we'll take these 12 random people into the woods with us. That's totally fine. And there's just so much that you can do with this. And as far as like going on nature walks, um, I think the big thing that really shocked me was at first, when I first did nature walks, I was just looking for wildlife or maybe a pretty flower. But then when I started using iNaturalist, I was like, the species diversity just increased a hundredfold. And it really even like just looking at ground covers growing on concrete, we did a whole month where that was like our eco quest. And you could, we found dozens of different species and some were beautiful like ground covers like creeping indigo, which had pink flowers and you could walk on it or mimosa, or when you stepped on it, the leaves would close up. It was a beautiful ground cover all the way up to some of the more weird ones like asthma plant. It, you don't want to eat it, don't worry. Um, I kind of want to drag you out to my backyard right now and be like, what's this? There's a grand, there's a ground cover in my backyard right now that I don't know what it is. That's the amazing <laughs> thing about iNaturalist is it doesn't matter what you're looking at is it will help you identify any kind of life form. And there are actually some people who are, again, like the botanists and Selby or experts in their field who help identify people. There's one person I saw who's helped identify over 46,000 bee posts by themselves and that's all they oh do is God. they're like, I'm a bee expert, I love bees. I'm just gonna identify bees all day. And you can get as so much- I, Do we have awards for those people yet? I feel like I feel like that person deserves an award. We actually- That's a lot of posts. <laughs> we're going to be offering awards for people who start um, partaking in the monthly challenges. And we're also gonna have bio blitzes. We're going to be um, really trying to get the community involved. 
And again, because it just is interacting with nature and identifying plants and animals, it's really, really useful for you to help figure out what's out there and get more in touch with nature. And the app is extremely user friendly. I've seen people who barely know how to use a smartphone figure it out. It's extremely useful. Okay, well, I wanna to cut to a couple questions from the chat. Charlie Barons would like to know, do any of you advocate for vegan choices within your spheres of influence? Um, I do not, but I could I could definitely bring it up to the club. And if any of my uh, members um, feel passionate about that and wanna um, take that and run with it, then, then definitely we could maybe figure that out. John, uh, kind of the same. I generally, um, I personally don't. Um, one of my staff members is very, very pro-vegan. Oh, at my other job, sorry. I, and there's lots of vegans at Selby. Um, I personally um, especially advocate for people eating lower on the food chain, um, especially, you know, like reducing, you don't need to have a hamburger every day, but, you know, there are certain um, proteins that are very sustainable. Um, for instance, like shellfish tends to be very sustainable. Um, shrimp is not. So you can kind of pick and actually, um, Monterey Bay has a great seafood guide for helping you mm -hmm. eat more sustainably. So there's always different methods. And I know a lot of people try to wean themselves off meat and eating sustainably, it can be a great first step in that. Flora, any additional comments? I, I see you nodding a lot. I know, <laughs> I would just add that that's not something that we advocate for as an organization. And I, I was just going mm -hmm. to say that, of course, the individual choices that we make are really important. And I take that really seriously within my own life as well. But one of the messages that I always want to underscore is that as much as our individual choice is important, creating the political will for large scale change is even more important. So that's the kind of work that I focus on supporting everyone's individual decisions, but also looking at the, the change that needs to happen in our, our legislative systems, advocating for our policymakers to take the steps that we need to so that we get that large scale change that will support all of the individual changes that we've been making. Awesome, so next question. What ways can people that are not used to going into nature dip their toes into learning about or visiting nature? I know that there's a couple of you that are super familiar with Sarasota area where if you're not sure about the outside or bugs or plants or, I mean, I know the mosquitoes are starting to go away, but what would you recommend for someone just starting out? Go ahead. There are, so okay. not everyone is set to go do a two day hike and camp out on a primitive trail in Mayaka. So definitely one of the best ways to start out is to visit some of the local county parks. For instance, Red Bug Slough, Water Tower Park is wheelchair accessible. Um, there's a lot of smaller parks that especially that have like nice paving or very easy trails to go on. And a lot of the trails are less than a half mile loop. Those are great to just get your foot in the water and those tend to be very well signed. So they have a lot of signage explaining what's going on. And they're also just as important to figure out what plants and animals are living in there through the Ecoflora and iNaturalist project. So that's probably the best way I'd recommend, but even just your backyard, there's a lot of wildlife out there. Just spending time in nature in any way can help. Mason, you mentioned that um, one of your projects now that you're starting to dive into is some research on sewage leaks. Could you share more about that? Um, sure. So, um, so far I've been um, talking to uh, Justin Bloom and Rusty Chinnis um, from Plant Coast Waterkeepers, um, and they've been kind of directing me um, on things to do to um, advocate um, on the topic of sewage leaks. Um, and so, so far, uh, we've just been um, trying to write letters to local newspapers, politicians, companies, stuff like that. Um, but I'm going to ask you to back up a little bit. How did you hear about this? What What is the cause? What's the need for this now? What inspired you to want to get into this research? What's going right. on? Right. So there are sewage leaks happening in Sarasota, and a lot of them are due to old infrastructure um, and construction. And so what really inspired me to get into it was um, it's disgusting, really. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, so I'm in Kids for Clean Water, um, and I have the ability to hopefully make a change in the difference in our water. 
Um, and so I, re I reached out to Justin Boomer and Rusty Chinnis, and they gave me some ideas. And um, but so and then so I went on from that, and I brought it to the club, and we talked about it, and we were all really excited about it. So then I'm starting to write letters to local newspapers, politicians, stuff like that. Um, but then also, um, it's we're trying to figure out ways because sometimes we get like a lazy response from the company or whatever. Um, so we're thinking maybe opening it to a larger audience like we're doing right now um, and maybe getting 50 letters instead of just five or protesting in person. Uh, but these are just things that we're talking about in the group and working on right now. So it sounds like that's something that you could use help with. Right. So if there are people that are interested in getting involved, it sounds like Florida Kids for Clean Water need help writing letters. Definitely. That'd be extremely helpful. Cool. Yeah, let's get it out there. Laura, tell us more about the the program at um, Audubon, Florida, the climate advocacy that you're talking about. What does it look like? Um, I know you mentioned some of the, the climate walks where you take a tour around and then you talk about solutions afterward. Um, but are there other options? What are you guys doing virtually now? I'd love to hear more about. Yeah, so as I mentioned, since um, since March of this year, most of what we've been doing has been virtual. And so we've shifted a lot of our trainings to an online platform. And that's what I've been doing. It's been liberating in some ways because I get to work with people all around the state. Um, and it also really helps because we get to tailor our training specifically. So let's say somebody reaches out to me via email and they say, I've got a group of people and we have this idea for how we want to engage with our local government, but we actually just don't know the first step to take. We'll communicate and I will say, okay, let me research this, let me figure it out. And then we'll work together to create a training that helps them help their own membership or their group of people create uh, a campaign or a program moving forward, and then we continue to check in and chat. So that's one of the ways that we can help. The other is that we're just, as similarly to what Mason was saying, we're encouraging people to write op-eds and LTEs and reach out to their elected officials and talk about how important climate solutions are to them and what kinds of places they want to see protected, right? We talk about natural solutions and we want climate solutions both so that we can keep those natural places protected and we all still get to enjoy them, but also because they're not, those natural places protect us. Um, and reaching out to and speaking to elected officials is <laughs> sometimes scary for folks who haven't done it before. Um, so we also offer like communications trainings and advocacy trainings to help with that. Um, and we're available as a sounding board for folks who want to get involved, but who might not know where exactly they can create that first kind of, you know, momentum. Awesome. This one, this question I think is going to end up going your way too. It's go, it's, um, but it's open. To, actually, sorry, Sean Mason, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, thank you. You want to add to programs? Okay. Um, Julia would like to know, what do you think is the easiest way or first steps to get nature curriculum, water, ecoflora, climate systems embedded in K-12 education? Was that for me or? For the group, whoever. Sean, can start. I know, Laura, you were a teacher and so that's where. I think you're, you'll have an opinion here too. If Laura's a teacher, let her go first. I mean, <laughs> so I, was, uh, I mean, Mason's the one in school, yeah. so we've got we've got all sorts. Um, of it. It's a tough question, um, um, but I'll take a go at it. Um, so I think that hands-on learning is really good, and it keeps the kids involved rather than just listening to a lecture. Um, so even just starting, like maybe just a small little garden, and learning about how um, that works, and then seeing how that works, and then getting to eat the strawberry that you grew out of the ground, and it, I feel like that's really powerful, and that can inspire a lot of kids, and they enjoy it. It's fun. It can work for water systems too, right? Florida Kids for Clean Water. That even that goes in, um, and it sounds like that's kind of how you got connected to the group in mm -hmm. the first place. Sean. Another way to help is to just one, contact the teachers and propose something. A lot of teachers are generally more open to it. Like I've done several courses with local teachers. I used to do a Science Friday 
um, with some kids. Um, but also, um, Selby Gardens has some great booths. Like we do like bromeliad tanks where people get to go fishing in our big native bromeliads and look at all the creatures that rely on them. And so even though we, and we can also do like small garden walks around the campus to use the Ecoflora project on the app to just identify what plants and animals are on the school grounds. There's a lot of different ways to get um, curriculums like this into schools and reaching out to many local organizations like uh, Selby Gardens has distinct budget for education. So we can send people out to schools to do projects. Um, and especially high schoolers are very, very um, app adept at using this app. It's very, very easy. Um, middle schools usually find two. Elementary, they usually need a little bit of help, but there's lots of different ways we can work with them. Uh, so I will just add to that from my, from my teaching days that there are organizations that already have curricula that are aligned with the standards that teachers need to use in their classrooms. And so, I would say the easiest is to make sure that whatever program you're using is already aligned with the standards because that's what teachers have to teach, right? And um, teachers are always looking for exciting and innovative things to do um, and ways to make their own lives easier because they work really, really hard. But the way that they will be able to implement it is if you can show that it already holds up the curriculum that they're supposed to be teaching. So. That would just be my recommendation for, for checking out an organization um, and making sure that then when you can go present it and talk to a teacher like Sean said, you're like, hey, here's this awesome opportunity. It already aligns with the standards. We'd love to see how we can help you make this happen. I'm gonna add here too, because I just sat on the call yesterday and it's fresh in my mind, Julia, that um, Sarasota has a, at Explore SRQ, which Selby also um, helps participate in, but it has approved um, lesson plans like Laura's talking about that helps get in and um, share those opportunities with schools. And I think that that is super cool because it can even work for homeschool kids like Mason um, or community and organizations could put their plan um, on there too. But I think it's just, is it, do you guys think it, it's breaking down walls. It's conversations like this where we all learn about what the other person's doing so that we can share more and collaborate together and connect. Um, another question, how can we get more students to be involved from a young age? How do we reach students? I think this one's for you, Mason. <laughs> um, let me think for a second. So a way to get students yep. involved from a young age is um, I think me personally is te teach them te teach them how it, it affects them because even this this works for adults um, too. When it's hard to think about something when it done when you when you don't realize how it affects you because it you feel dis you just feel disconnected from it. Then it it's not like clicking in your brain. So if you say if you show it the life cycle of a raindrop and how it eventually gets into your body and it and it fuels you so you can move around suddenly that's a lot more important to that person and maybe they'll take that and they'll learn something else and learn something else and then they could be in my position at, in a club like mine advocating for um, our environment. Um, yeah. Another great way to get students involved from a young age is to have a variety of methods of teaching. Not all students can just look at a whiteboard and regurgitate information like that. There's tactile, visual, auditory learners. In fact, I cannot remember someone's name unless I see it and write it out. You can say it to me a thousand times and I'll never remember. And then as students get older, you want to, one, keep up that variety so that they still have that method that they prefer to learn. But as a lot of students, especially when they hit high school, and start preparing for college and you know um, higher education or just entering the workforce i find that paid internships are huge if you want students to go from being young to older and keep staying involved in the environment because there's a lot of students who want to do stuff like this but money is a huge issue and i've seen a lot of great environmentalists not be able to do environmental things because they were priced out and so if you're uh, if you run an environmental organization or you have money to donate to environmental organizations, see if you can make sure that they get some paid interns. 
I know everyone loves to talk about free interns and the organizations like that, but that really prices out most of the best people that you can hire. Laura, you were in the classroom and I know that there are standards and it's challenging um, for teachers to have to do all that, but how, how for as, and I know you're not a teacher anymore, Always but teacher. as community members, yeah, fair, 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 I take it back. Um, so as community members or as um, members and volunteers or leaders in organizations and nonprofits, do you have any advice for us on um, connecting with teachers in, in spaces? I know they always have a million things going on and we wanna be helpful to that, um, but suggestions on being better able to connect to them? Does my question make sense? It does, and I think it actually goes back to the previous question because I think the best way to connect with teachers is to really create meaningful opportunities for the students. Um, the majority of teachers really are there because they have great love for young folks and they have great love for teaching. So teachers are always excited when, and this is true, you know, we partner with universities, for example, and the universities, when, we're, when we pitch programs to them, they're like, but you're going to take care of our kids, right? Like, um, you know, so they want to know that there are great opportunities out there for them. And part of that involves the experiential learning that we were talking about. I used to teach high school and I would say too, leadership opportunities for students. It's not just integrating them into what's already happening. And this is also me speaking from my advocacy background, but um, if we can create more leadership opportunities for students and let them shine uh, and learn sometimes as adults when we can take a back seat and when it is that their voices really should be elevated, I think that that's one way to connect to teachers as well. Awesome. So a couple more questions, we'll see where we get because it's gonna um, kick us out. We got about seven minutes left here. Um, so today we are all about transforming to new ways forward. That's today's theme. We've heard it through most of the presentations today. I'd like to ask each of you in a nutshell, what does that mean to you and you, like from your organization, from your standpoint? Um, I, I'll just go. Um, so transform to me, it looks like um, creating opportunities for our community to rally behind um, issues like climate change, um, climate change, overdevelopment, um, sewage, um, and that and these issues that they affect us locally and globally. And so we need we need to be united. And so I also think that 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 that's number one. That's that's my first way of transforming news forward. And then also is our as kids for clean water. That is a big way of transforming news forward. Um, kids instead of adults making at making decisions advocating and um doing things that are, that can actually ha make a difference and make change this is your world now we're just living here sean there are so many different ways to interact so one of the best things i would recommend is just to start doing something for the environment you don't have to completely stop using plastic and compost everything and do a 100% shift right away. And the nice thing about the EcoFloor project is that you can do as much as you want with the project. You can join and then just help ID things. You can join and go out and do a thousand observations. Um, I know one person who has over 1,500 observations just in Sarasota and Manatee alone, and they have found over 500 species. So there's a lot of different ways that you can help get involved. And if you were to tell a botanist 20 years ago that we were going to be asking people to go out with phones and take pictures of plants and that they would be on an, a scientific and herbarium based like level and that they would be helping the scientific community, they would have called you crazy. But the problems of the past and today are not going to be fixed generally with the technology of today. We're constantly finding new technologies and new methods of fixing these problems. And one of the best ways to help preserve plants, preserve animals, and to just identify and get in touch with nature can now actually be done with an app. So there's an app for that. <laughs> Laura, transforming the new ways forward. To me, it always goes back to the idea of community and 
strengthening and changing the way that we relate to one another and the way that we relate to our planet. Um, and I think that those two things are not able to be disentangled from one another. Um, one of the things that I always talk about is that you know, when I was younger, particularly, I heard people talk about nature, like it was this mysterious place somewhere far away in the hazy recesses uh, of the world. Um, and there there wasn't a lot of conversation about what nature had to do with me um, or what wildlife had to do with me or what birds had to do with me. And the reason why I became, I think, so passionate about climate solutions is because that message resonated with me because people were saying, here's how this affects you. And then through that, I came to the conservation world and I came to the realization, of course, that we talk about ecosystems, we're also talking about human systems. There is no definitive place in space and time where our communities stop and nature begins. So when we, when we move forward and we think about new ways forward, it's with a recognition and a deep respect for that interdependence. Um, and then creating the types of deep relationships and communities that we need to sustain ourselves as we're moving forward and really, really advocate for the, the world that we wanna live in. That's amazing. And I relate to that a lot. I'm gonna do one more round robin. Um, to wrap it up, what is the one way that you would love people to get involved right now? How can they support you? Um, like I said before, letters. Um, but also, I just want to say this one thing before before we end. Um, yeah. Go out and and work and and help us and and do what you feel is right and do what matters to you. Because as expensive it is, as it is now, and I'm not saying it's it's gonna cost money, um, but other than money, it's also gonna cost mental energy, physical energy. Um, and so as expensive as it is now, it's nowhere near as expensive as it will be if we keep leaving it to future generations. Chan? So pull out your phone or your laptop, go to iNaturalist, Join the Sarasota Manatee Ecofloor Project. We have a write-up of that on the screen. And join the project. We have a journal where we talk about all the bio blitz we're doing. Uh, we talk about the eco quests. And the best part is, is that you can be out there with kids for clean water, helping to clean up the beach. And if you find a cool animal or a cool shell and you just want to know what it is, use the app. You can help do conservation while you're cleaning up the water. If you're out bird spotting, just put the birds on the app. You're already looking at birds. If you're out there helping and doing other environmental things, or just taking a walk in nature, you can always use the app and it's just right there on your phone. Um, in fact, sometimes I'll go out on hikes with my friends and I'll be like, hey, let's go see if we can find some really cool um, plants or animals. And you, it keeps a life list. You can compare, you can make it competitive, you can use it to relax, but just get active. It's one of the lowest bars to citizen science you can have. And I've seen people take it to just be a casual recreational thing, all the way up to helping discover new species and preserve endangered ones. So the app is extremely useful. Oh, and it scrambles the location of endangered species. So don't worry, if you find something endangered, only the scientists behind the app will figure it out. Hmm. Laura? So I would say to go to our website and on our climate change advocacy page, you can sign up for our newsletter um, during legislative session, we do send out updates every week with what's happening at the Capitol. So if you're one of us who works like a regular job and doesn't have your finger on the pulse of exactly what's happening uh, day to day in the, in the Capitol, we've got folks up there who are keeping us informed. And then also on that page, you've got our contact information. So like I said, if you're one of those who's thinking, there would be a great opportunity for my group to receive a training so we can move forward. My email information, I think you all have, reach out to me. I can help that, set that up for you. And then of course I would say also reach out to our local Audubon chapters who've got programs happening on the ground. So I know that Karen dropped her information there. You can go to the website. Hopefully those climate walks will be happening in 2021. And that's a great way for people to both be outdoors and get engaged and learn about new climate solutions. 
This was so fantastic. And Julia had it poignantly in the session chat. It was so hopeful. Um, I think that this has been an, a challenging year. And thank you all so much for doing everything that you do and fighting the good fight. Um, I invite everyone that is still watching us right now to head back on over to the main stage. We are gonna wrap for the day. It's on the left side. Um, and we have some prizes, so don't just check out and leave. We have some awesome prizes. Um, and I'm gonna pop up back there in a second um, and tell you about them. But thank you everyone for being here and hanging out with us. I obviously think that this was the best panel of thank the day. Thank you so much so. for the opportunity. It was really fun. Thank you, Rebecca, for having us on. This was great. Thank you. This was wonderful. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye, guys. See you, See you on the other side. Bye.